Uh, last time there was a question about Jung's theory on inflation. You might think that one that negative in, negative so-called inflation would be called deflation, right? But in both cases, uh, contents of the unconscious are being annexed to uh, the ego. And so either the ego becomes excessively grandiose or the ego is overwhelmed by these content. Now because both involve annexation of contents of the unconscious, <coughs> unwarranted annexation, both are called inflation. And then he chose words positive and negative to indicate you know, you could say grandiose and what would be another word for grandiose inflation? Grandiose is good. Yeah. What? Megalomania. And the other, the opposite side would be some sort of catatonic, right? Withdrawal. Maybe not quite catatonia, but what would be something that's not quite withdrawal on the level of catatonia? Nervous dystaxia. Nervous breakdown? <laughs> yes. What? Really? Hmm. Well, then as you have seen from reading this, Jung felt that the s spiritual enterprise of a total cleanup of the mind and spirit, whatever you want to call it, was impossible. He was a psychotherapist, and uh, you know he felt people could make some gradual advancement, and that anything else was pie in the sky. And he, you know, from the wise experience of his psychotherapy, uh, <laughs> he knew that aiming at such heights was uh, ridiculous. Well, he drew the conclusion that it was ridiculous, based undoubtedly on the patience that he had before him and on his own work. And of course, it's very hard if you travel the world to find somebody who uh, is totally liberated. Mm, yes? Especially seems to say, uh, mostly for Europeans, it's impossible. I don't know. I, I, I huh? kind of found that it seemed that for Easterns and for for them, for the Tibetans or the Indians, in their context, it could be possible that the European thing is. I don't think that's his point. I think his point is that only uh, Europeans would be stupid enough to try to do the whole thing. The Tibetans and Indians are smart enough to know this is just pie in the sky. You know, we know how to conduct our society. And you know, and one could we could add our own pejorative twist to it. We identify children who come along as <laughs> reincarnations of the Buddha. You know, that's how we take care of it. You know, okay. I think that's his point. He's saying only Europeans could be dumb enough to uh, think that this to take these exhortations seriously. You know, because you don't have the cultural context. It's like somebody who's identified as a reincarnation and raised in Tibet. That person is not uh, always treated, you know, oh, you can have your way in whatever you want. Rather, the child is very cleverly handled. I mean, if your handlers are clever. A one lama who visited here, his technique with his re the reincarnate lamas that were assigned to him was to say, now be nice or you won't be a reincarnation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought, wow, what a trip to have laid on you. <laughs> and then uh, one of my friends is, was one of his reincarnate charges, and he turned out very well. So <laughs> I had to think, well, there was some wisdom to it.
Okay, what would you like to splinter a psyche? Um, I was really, my, let's see, my introduction to Jung, well, I don't know the beginning of it, but in any way, uh, in some depth, I guess, was in my senior year in college, which I uh, just took a reading course and picked up his collected works at various places and pursued various topics and read this and read that. Um, and I was really struck by his theory of autonomous complexes, that things get started in the mind and they as if have their own power and they intrude on your consciousness. So they, they have splintered, you see, splinter, they have splintered off from the main mind and he, and they like to have their own psyche. And they're called autonomous, right, because they have their own power. They're not under your power. And, you know, recurrent dreams, mistakes that you make in speaking that reveal something that's going on in your mind. What else? Jim, what's running through your head? Yes. Jingles running through your head. <laughs> you know, when you get down to it, it's practically everything. Right. <laughs> I think these low risk definitions are becoming autonomous complexes. Yes. Yes. Well, uh, that's interesting. Uh, they should. That's how you learn a language. <laughs> get to the point where where phrases and how you how you put together things. I mean, I find myself opening up the refrigerator first thing in the morning and the stuff is like... Oh, that's good. <laughs> that's a good sign. Well, I've been thinking of it, of it as some sort of sickness. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a good sign to a certain point. I'm not quite sure where that point is. <laughs> yes? So are all these autonomous complexes negative in his point of view? Or are there possible positive autonomous complexes? Positive, yes. Um, Predispositions? One thing he's interested in is de-autonomizing. De uh, that's a very good question. Uh, Can you say the question again? Uh, is it, are there positive autonomous complexes? Or can mm -hmm. some of them be positive? They seem to all be negative. It, by the very word autonomous and the fact that they are splintered off suggests that they shouldn't have their own power but do. But given that he does not hold that you could clean up everything, I would doubt that he's uh, seeking to de-autonomize everything. I think the Buddhists are seeking to de-autonomize. So who's in control in the end? Well, it's very interesting. It's said that a Buddha is under the power right. of compassion. Right. Right. And that through prior cultivation of the path, Everything is done spontaneously, automatically. <laughs> it would be the most supreme autonomous complex. <laughs> uh, Jung talks, uh, well, as you've seen here, uh, when objects lose their autonomy and the mind, the spirit, becomes more autonomous, then this is, this is like God dwelling within or ultimate deity dwelling within and you become full of that. But he's quite willing to call this another autonomous complex. Right. Or in other words, what's the difference between a strong ego and egolessness? Hmm. All right. For I him? That's a related question. For yeah, him? for him. Or does he see a possibility? He wants a strong ego. Right. And, and I think Buddhists want a strong ego. Right. Because when you're, I mean, in Buddhist terms, you talk, wisdom is discrimination. Definition of wisdom <coughs> is discrimination. He thinks that in the East, uh, if you were dumb enough to take it literally, you'd be thrown into a psychotic state of chaos, lacking discrimination, mm -hmm. lacking, uh, lacking virtue. 
And what's interesting, one point that's interesting for me is that Jung emphasizes the difference between, I don't know, he says public <coughs> virtues, I don't know if the other side is private virtues, that are more grounded in your own life, that aren't some grand displays of charity and so forth. And when you look, I think that's very wise. You can't just be involved in, in uh, self-conception of, of that, that is grand, even if it's pure. It has to be rooted in your own life and rooted in the people that you're, that you're dealing with. And I don't know where this appears in Buddhist doctrines. It probably appears in biography. That's where you would get this sort of material. Whereas in Jung, you get it right with a theory. Yes? Would it be fair to say that uh, when one enters Buddhism by taking refuge, and in particular taking refuge in the Sangha, that they somehow make a social commitment to the people in the world around them? Uh, yes, if it's, if it's done in an intimate sort of way. Otherwise, it again could be done. And, oh yes, I have grand commitment to Sangha. It means very little, and is a sign of sickness. So, one he's seeking to confront the autonomous complexes, find out a good bit of what's going on. Impossible to find out at all. And by confronting, assimilating. That doesn't mean assimilating by identifying, but by confronting and knowing what your mind is up to, you de-autonomize it at least a little. Now, what I see going on in the level of the form deity when the rays of light <coughs> go out, go out and so forth, and you, you see some of what your weird or autonomous complexes are doing, if your mind actually lights up and you see the various types of beings and so forth, and you educate them, you help them and educate them, I think they're being trained more helped more, being more de-autonomized uh, de than in Jung's system. There's, in a Nyingma version of a cleansing meditation, uh, one takes an ambrosia down into one's own body, and when it, and it much like a washing machine, there's, there's a few versions of it. One version is that it just pushes all the crud out the bottom. Another version is like a washing machine. It, the crud comes up to the top, and you spew out all the crud in your body. A third version is this ambrosia goes in and destroys all the crud right there on the spot. But the third one is, is uh, it, this is, it doesn't have the feature that the first two does. First, in the first two, it said, this crud goes out, and it goes down seven stories. I always like it when they say seven, and it's not, not six. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> goes down seven stories, which may have something to it. You see, it's getting it away from you. And it, and down there are all the people to whom you own anything, own, owe anything. All the animals whose flesh you've eaten. Can you imagine? All these chickens. Cattle. <laughs> wow. What is it? Chickens, cattle, lamb, sheep. Deer. Deer. Fish. Yeah, can you see all those fish down there? And all the, are they shrimp? Oh, just, you can you see all of them? No wonder you keep them seven, seven stories down. <laughs> then you gotta see him. You gotta see him. 
So you're giving them your crud? Is that what? <laughs> no. What happens is, in anyone you owe anything to, like you have a debt, there are all sorts of, you know, just in this lifetime, uh, debts, m money debts and psychic debts and uh, so forth. And the crud, when it gets down somewhere, it doesn't say how many stories down, turns into whatever they want. The crud. It's incredible. The crud turns into whatever they want. And satisfies. And then there's Again, gradually, this process, you know, of, over the course of long meditations of what long period of time, where where these beings are educated and so forth, and and they go off. They go away. They've got no hold on you anymore. You see. So I would put that practice together with this one, where it just talks about going down as as if. These are just other beings, hell beings, hungry ghosts, animals, humans, demigods, gods. There's just other beings who have some form of pain and you're helping them. Well, also there are other beings to whom one has uh, some debt. And it's very interesting then when your crud goes down there, right? It's all this. You know, we imagine ourselves to be ordinary. And this is asking people to imagine themselves as being composed of a mind realizing emptiness motivated by compassion. Composed by that. So then, what, what is this then? It's largely crud. <laughs> and they say it comes out in the form of spiders. And <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> <laughs> and when it goes down there, it's, it's quite interesting to watch what it turns into. Oh, wow. You know? Because it's, uh, you're not always choosing what it turns into. So one, it becomes interesting, it becomes a process of confrontation with your own unconscious to see what beings gather. The, the one who just gathered for me is Charlie Chapman, who beat me up either in kindergarten or first grade. I think it was kindergarten. He was smoking cigarettes already in kindergarten. <laughs> Breaking windows, too. And he beat me up, made me split. I went running to my mother. She made me split. She said, no. <laughs> she didn't give a damn. <laughs> then in the second grade, I beat him up. And I noticed that the teachers were watching from the window, and they left me. <laughs> they didn't like him either. But now I just realized I've got a debt to him. <laughs> and I was like, no, I don't want to pay him anything. <laughs> But aren't these just more autonomous complexes in mean, the whole visualization? Yes. It seems like they're just one more autonomous complex. Yes. It's so like how do control splintering off, I guess you could say. Well I don't I don't think it is control. I think you're opening up and seeing some of your own autonomous complexes that are already there, not creating new ones. And then what you're doing with them de autonomizes them. That's the that's my point. I, I don't understand. What you're doing with them, because you're feeding them, you're repaying them, you're, lose, you're, you're extending love to them, and thereby they lose their power over you. And it would be the same. They're being satisfied. But you're feeding and it's them interesting in the, what? But you're feeding them your crud. But you're know. not. Your crud. Turns in, it's like oil that comes out of the ground in one form, but it's used as like gasoline. It, it turns into the most marvelous things that they want. It is not your crud, then. Okay, but by what power is it 
transforming. Oh, come on, it just does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, no, it just does. Excuse me? Yes, yes, yes. 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 I think so. I think so. This whole thing makes it possible. This huge changeability of phenomena. Yeah, good point. Yes. I'm trying to get two things together. Um, one, the personal identification with the deity, and uh, then what we can call these superstructures that are somehow autonomous. And in both cases, I see a process of visualization, reification, to the point of solidified hallucination, to the point where one can believe in that hallucination and believe that you are that hallucination. And that, in modern psychoanalysis, um, equals uh, psychosis. Yes, and, it's... Uh, now, where is the difference between the realization of emptiness and appearance and psychosis? Yeah. Um, with respect to identifying as a deity, it's very interesting. It's said you're supposed to come to the point where you uh, believe, I am the deity. You can't, deity can't be somewhere else. Uh, you you have to feel, you know, this is me as much as I'm, I'm not as much as I'm Jeffrey Hopkins, but uh, pretty much as much as I'm Jeffrey Hopkins. But then they also say, this is not from the absolute depths. You're not cultivating a wrong consciousness, a, mis a complete misidentification. You're purposely doing this for a certain effect in order to promote transformation. So you don't go out of the room, you know, thinking that you're Manjushri or Avalokiteshvara. Um, you're not, well, I've said it. You're, you're not cultivating wrong consciousness. Yes? Then I have to Follow ask, um, Deity Yoga becomes a schizophrenic state where you divide yourself into two beings, one the deity and one Jeffrey Hopkins. I don't think so, really. I don't think so. Well, and there's also the dissolve at the end, which is important. Yeah, there's the dissolve at the end, but you reappear as the deity in simpler form and go about your daily activities. So he, not, just yeah. is, he just wants to uh, <laughs> paint the picture in bold strokes, <laughs> bold colors. You do reappear as the deity and go about your daily activities, supposedly, as the deity. But you're not, you know, saying to the cop who arrests you, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Shri, you know? You ask for your name. You say, you can't arrest me. And, but people do get into that head, right? Not from doing deity yoga, most likely, or at least, you know, I think from having done emptiness yoga in the beginning, the possibility of such a delusionary state would be extremely low. Mm, yes? Isn't it possible that maybe one of your autonomous complexes could be so powerful that you wouldn't be able to overcome it or confront yes. it or something like yes. that? Yes, yes. I think seems, this is, yes. It seems like so you can really do some harm if you find yes. one that you can overcome. Yes. What would you do in a case like that? <laughs> uh, I think it's very true. And it's very true with any practices that disturb the, the setup of your mind, that you're going to unleash a content that you can't control, that's going to make a mess out of things, that will, or a content that will encourage you uh, to do something uh, like what he's suggesting and um, make a nut out of yourself. Or a content that overwhelms you. This is just the more megalomania version. Or a content that uh, uh, causes uh, negative inflation. So I think the question is, does this system have a complement of practices that, that could possibly ameliorate? Uh, such problems. I think these are, they begin with refuge, taking refuge in Buddha, the doctrine, spiritual community. They go on to 
be the fundamental recognition of impermanence, of suffering, uh, the development of compassion, and uh, having engaged in this over a long period of time, such that when difficulties arise, you can call on those practices. You have some hope of calling on those practices. And that you will know better to cease a certain practice if you're getting into too much difficulty. That you'll be able to keep in mind that the aim is for more flexibility, and if you're becoming less flexible, you better stop and find something that'll make you uh, more flexible. It's not going to be easy. Could you externalize it? Get into that well, that'd be another way of doing it. Could you see that uh, yes. as other... I, I was going to, uh, the, the first thing that came to my mind uh, was half joke, half not. I was going to say, pray. Well, that's another way of doing it, imagining the Buddha and Bodhisattvas and so forth and asking for help. Or of asking for a ritual to be done that handles a certain autonomous complex. Yes. I was going to ask if, uh, referring to Jung, if the only thing that afflicted the psyche was uh, these autonomous complexes, the only thing that deluded them that needed to be cleansed. Is that all just these autonomous complexes? Uh, since almost everything or everything's in autonomous complex, it's, it's too broad a question. So, uh, is the only problem autonomy? Supposedly, he's saying that it is impossible to completely cleanse the psyche. Yes. Is he saying that there's an infinite amount of these autonomous yes. complexes yes. and you can never get rid of them? Yes. Okay. And that evil is endemic to the mind, endemic to the psyche. Good and evil, the two sides. A Freud, in the earlier part of his life, set forth a theory of libido or eros, love, of union, of connection. Later part of his life, he'd uh, gone through war, he'd gone through tongue cancer. Uh, he believed in eros and thanatos, love and death, uh, desire and anger, and that these were endemic to the mind. And uh, a huge issue between them and these Buddhist systems is whether uh, desire and hatred are, you know, afflictive desire and hatred are endemic to the mind, or whether the mind, or whether these are peripheral. No matter how much, I mean, our own evidence, right? Our own lives are evidence that these seem to be endemic. Um, but whether that's good evidence or not, that's a huge issue. But it still doesn't, you know, I, I like to look at Buddhism in two ways. One, this ultimate goal of complete purification. But two, also, many, many practices for uh, psychic, social, spiritual uh, health in, in the meantime. That that everything doesn't depend upon the final claim. I'm not trying to rescue Buddhism, but a little bit hard to decide about the final claim. Uh, the uh, Dalai Lama says, for me, somewhat unconvincing, but um, uh, provocative things like, when you sneeze, are you desirous or hateful during the period of sneezing? You know, <laughs> when you're seeing stars, it. Have you ever sneezed so hard you see stars? He doesn't say when you see snars, stars, but snars. Uh, <laughs> so you see, that's a case of mind without desire or hatred. You see, can the mind be without desire or hatred? It's actually my own conviction that there can be mind without desire or hatred. I don't know if that particular example you know, sometimes somebody gives you something to think about, you, you, 
<laughs> your conviction gets a little shaky. Yes. Couldn't the ego just be another uh, autonomous complex? Yes, and he says that. So. And so you're you're like jiggling your autonomous complexes, um, so that. I mean, isn't the whole problem simply the autonomy? The problem. The, the problem is autonomy, but it seems that you cannot get around it. So you're jiggling autonomies, so you making some things one. more and less o autonomous. But if one thing becomes less autonomous and another thing becomes more autonomous? It seems that way. Until you get from one his big autonomy. Well, he, he's not see he doesn't seem to be seeking that. He doesn't want you to be overwhelmed with God within. Yes? If the ego is a an autonomous complex, then what is it? You know, I, I don't think, I, when you read through, I don't think anything, that there's anything that isn't. That's why I chose the particular quotes I did. Uh, you, and you, you may notice from the volume numbers that are chosen, 16 I see appears here quite a bit, but there's quite a, you know, they're chosen from many places in his collective works. Maybe it's because I still don't quite understand what an autonomous complex is, but it just seems odd to me to identify certain things as autonomous complexes, like the beings that you're feeding and stuff like that. Because doesn't that, in a way, take away from the otherness that's behind this? I mean, oh, yes. Mm. Well, I'm just sort of sitting here confronting my own mind, and, as opposed to thinking about other beings. Yeah, well, I'm... Nat because of my own background, I'm naturally led into psychologizing these practices. And it becomes another way of talking about them in order to uh, bring to life what I think is going on in the practices. And I actually don't know, you know, if you you have a problem that's within. Might doing an external right actually help an internal problem? Why not? I mean, it's you who's thinking it's helping. And then also inside and outside are not so disconnected that uh, jiggling with what's going on on the outside uh, could, uh, you know, it's like taking medicine. Maybe. Yes? It seems that if you take the view of emptiness, then there is no autonomy because... Yes. So that's Young's problem, it seems, is that he doesn't have a sense of emptiness. Or does I think that's true. For he him... Or doesn't have Yes. Emptiness would mean loss of control, lack of discrimination, a melting down of the capacity of the mind to realize, and uh, doesn't appear to be what realization of emptiness is. Right. It's compatible with appearance, uh, says something more about appearance is realized in a state of mind that is highly discriminative. So omniscience for him is not possible? No. Right. Like when he talks about the alchemist's goal, goal of uh, transmuting all into gold, which metaphorically stands for turning everything into the all good. Right. He says that's just plain impossible. And you can't blame him, I mean, But I suppose one could blame him for saying it's only Western jerks who would think that Easterners were propounding that this actually could happen, All right? The Easterners are just as much oh, yeah. uh, jerks, although I think people from outside of like India, Tibet, China, and Japan, uh, sometimes when you're out of the cultural context, you make certain jumps. We make certain jumps that the cultural context helps to soften. Yes? I'm thinking a little bit about the distinction between the
conscious and unconscious mm -hmm. for you all. And, uh, it seems like the unconscious is almost like an other, it's sort of cut off from from the conscious mind is sort of is the ego. Maybe I'm wrong, but I'm not. It's probably just thinking out loud about that. The unconscious, you know, has all this sort of murky stuff happening around it's, that it's autonomous and that it's somehow threatening to the conscious mind. And, uh, I don't know if that's appropriate or not. It's interactive. It impinges on consciousness. It's interactive. You can't get away from it. Uh, it's splintered off with its own power, but it's splintered. See, splintered means it, it, it actually is part of, of the, of the gr well, he doesn't have greater mind, I think. Uh, but you have to assume that it's, once it's splintered, I mean, is it like something that separates out and is truly entirely independent? Can't be, because it can lose its autonomy back to the ego. I wonder how that lines up with Tibetan uh, distinctions between conceptual and non-conceptual mind. It seems like in, in some systems the non-conceptual is, which is not the, the ordinary thinking mind, is held up as something, uh, in fact, more important than the conscious function of the mind. <coughs> non-conceptual, for instance, eye consciousness is non-conceptual. Ear, nose, tongue, body consciousness, they're non-conceptual. And then there's non-conceptual realization of impermanence, suffering, emptiness, and so forth. I think uh, more of the topic comes with karma. Um, karma are these potencies that are, and I'm, I'm using Buddhist technical language, are potencies that are infused in the mind and that affect that order one's experience. And then there's no mention of how karma works. Well, maybe what Jung, Freud, and so forth and um, are saying, uh, are giving uh, at least some indication about how karma works. How do you, and this is jumping a little bit outside of the young context that you've established here, but I mean, the one other term that I've seen him use, and maybe you bring up a little bit, is a, it seems like he uses a kind of positive sense of individuation. Yes. That this process of a, sim, a simulation of the unconscious autonomous complexes with this confrontation with the consciousness um, generates. Mm. Individuation, mm. and I'm wondering how we could talk about that as far as deity yoga goes and Tibetan practice goes. Is there a sense of what what is the um, correlate in deity yoga with this kind of individuation that he posits? Well, it said every Buddha is individual. It said there's only one truth body. In Tibetan, Chugu Nyakchik. But that every Buddha is individual. And individuation, I think, for Jung, one of the meanings is possessing a high degree of discrimination, of judgment. And if you look uh, to make a case against deity yoga, here you are identifying with an idealized form. With general virtue. But I think these practices of um, cleaning up the universe are very individual, the way I see it. And you could say, imagine the hells, hungry ghosts, 
animals, humans, demigods, gods, and clean them up. That's all very stylized. It's very stylized to do somebody else's deity. All right? Wearing hats and ornaments and so forth that either they wore in India or Tibet. Although they're rather nice. <laughs> And um, if you imagine the house that you're living in, right, it's not like a huge apartment house, which would probably be a lot easier for us to imagine, right? Even with a hundred rooms. You get, oh yeah, the structure, oh yeah, there'd be ten this way, ten that way, five over here, six there, and it's repeated floor after floor after floor. And uh, yeah, and, and you know, at least where 20 of the people live, you got 20 friends around the apartment, and so you imagine 20 deities here and there and so forth. And you know, when you go, if you live in an apartment house, it's fairly complex, or you go to New York City, after a couple of weeks of visiting New York City, you get the road straight, you know, where this is, where that is. That's what it's like to imagine a mandala, grounds with, a, with your own house, and a certain number of deities. Of course, when it gets to be 720 deities, that's a lot. But actually, if you did it day after day, imagining, you know, over here is so and so, there is so and so, and back of me is so and so, and back of me, and then in the corner is so and so, and back over there is so and so. After a while, you, your mind would be ahead of these, right? After all, for the first hundred. And then some of them would be similar in type. Uh, there are the offering persons over here, you know, there are two, two, there's two on each side of the door, so that's four, eight, six, whatever. Yes. So, individuation. I think you get it. My guess is that, as I was saying earlier, it's on the... Uh, or hinting at earlier, it's on the level of actual implementation within the society that it's not that clear in, in the literature that people who become grand and make, you know, <coughs> grand entrances and consider themselves to be high beings are made fun of. They're brought down to earth. And even if you're still doing deity yoga, You've got to interact with your friends on an individual basis, which is part of individuation. There's a story you may have heard me tell before. Lama, we incarnate Lama, who was at a ceremony, ceremony, series of lectures that I was at. And he was sitting next to me. And uh, under his robe, he was doing mantra. And his mouth was going and everybody else was sitting around somewhat relaxed. And the, the guy next to him said, hey, we must have a bodhisattva here. <laughs> <laughs> and he persisted. And so, you know, went on to, to uh, you know, it's sort of like, come on, get off it. Yeah. <laughs> I think you also get um, individuation. Um, you were talking about this at the end when you were offering how um, deity yoga may actually combat some of one's problems. And you said that um, that altruism, you know, the way that your motivation um, towards these people or whatever in this um, practice establishes the inner structure of the individual. It's, the, it's altruism that yes. you know, it creates that inner mm. structure of the individual. And then you're going to enact it when you rise from your session, even if you're still appearing as a deity, you're going to teach, uh, you're going to engage in various activities that are very specific. You're not just going to sit on the throne. Yes? So could you say then that uh, a Buddha's autonomous complex is maybe thought of as his emanations? Well, I would, I mean, I don't think there's any way that you could use the word autonomous complex for a Buddha. Jung might, right? And yet an emanation seems to be 
Something that comes close, no? Well, if, as in some other systems, emanations go out and live their own lives and like become dumb and don't know that they're emanations and they have to be educated and things like that, then yes. But emanations are uh, totally controlled by the emanating being, emanator. Yes? Going back to individuation, I mean, isn't imagining oneself as a deity individual? It's, it's I'm imagining yes. myself as a deity, not yes. you as the deity. Yes. Yes. So it's grounded in the whole. Yes. Even though it's grounded in emptiness. <laughs> yes. But it's still a. I think that's very important. And it's not some dumb mind that's doing this. It's a very bright mind. It's um, the, the very sense of self that you have, of pure self, pure body, pure mind, pure self that you designated independence on pure mind and body means individuation. No question. And then on top of that, you need public virtues, and you need individual virtues, I think. Yes? Could it not be that, it, not at the level of enlightenment, but at the level of practice, we are projecting out our own autonomous um, problem structures, basically, and coping with them as realms of the mandala, and then reintegrating them in the course of the practice? It's not necessary that Tsongba says you can here just practice a single deity. It's not necessary to imagine other deities in this house called the mandala, all right? Uh, but then when the practice gets more developed, people imagine other deities in the mandala that stand for other aspects of the personality. And uh, I think to a certain extent, surely, one is externalizing uh, internal factors confronting them at least in a pure form, and then these are merging back with yourself, for instance, at the end of the practice, and then you're re-emerging as the single form to go about your daily activity. I mean, merging Jung and this is asking too much. Jung believes in, in uh, good and bad good and evil are right in the structure of the mind. This is going this is, is going a step further, or maybe from his point of view, a step backward. So, is it fair to say that the system that, that they diverge or it breaks down on that point? I mean this deity yoga is predicated on the sense that the nature of the mind is pure. I mean, the purification practice we described, that, that there's a, it makes sense, it's the way we've described it, seeing these other beings is in some ways autonomous complex is like, I mean, I find it valuable, but uh, there seems like this deeper sense where it's, the comparison is difficult. I think they div diverge as to whether complete enlightenment is possible. I don't think they d diverge at the point of deity yoga. Follow? Because Jung could still go along with the practice of deity yoga in order to uh, develop certain virtues, develop certain understanding, better uh, self-image, uh, etc. It'd certainly be warning you not to uh, not to uh, get carried away with it. Though. Because the mind isn't really pure, and those forms are really harmful. Yes, you would be grandly trying to be what you couldn't be. And I think there are plenty of lessons within Tibetan and Indian society that there are many people who consider themselves to be grand too early, to have made it to the deity level too early, right? And then what happens is that everything that you do becomes sanctified. So if you have a wish for 
a Cadillac, then that's sanctified. And people should give this to you. And then you end up with 40. You know, it's hard to stop it. Really, it is. And if you get angry, then that's sanctified. This is religious rage. And the dangers, thus, of identifying yourself with a pure being are horrendous, horrendous. And then, uh, of course, in this process, because one is around such a person, uh, one tends to do it oneself. If this is your teacher, then when these impulses come up in yourself, you, <laughs> you uh, end up mimicking the very same, very same behavior. Yeah, yeah. So then, notice on page uh, 51, oh, I was talking about noticing, that's how I think I got into it, perhaps, noticing the afflictive emotions of the teacher and substituting pure appearance for them, but noticing them, not sanctifying them, and thus, you see, not coming to identify with them and being drawn yourself into acting this way, actually by substituting appearances and seeing a deity who's you know, not acting this way, um, you're, you're probably uh, counteracting your own tendencies to uh, mimic the teacher. I live with a Mongolian teacher that I mimicked for, I don't know, two or three years, and then understood that I was making a mess out of myself, and I shouldn't mimic him. Shouldn't. That was how I was to learn that I should not mimic what he was doing. I should do what he says, not what he, not what he does. And then it was, oh, wow, within a day, a new way of living. A friend of mine there that I used to always get pissed off at and used to argue like hell, he then said to me, but now what will I do? Because <laughs> I wouldn't argue. Mm. Stories. Notice on the bottom, structure of the action tantra path. This, it's in three phases. Prior approximation, affecting achievement of feats, and activity. <coughs> and as you read, this appears to be, I mean, it, it is an order. Prior approximation is divided into the preliminaries, motivation, all the washing and so forth, and then the actual session, generation in front, generation of yourself as a deity and the various repetitions, which when you become competent at, allow you to pass on to the, the phase of affecting achievement of feats, where you do a special type of either repetition of mantra or doing of burnt offerings, offerings into fire, uh, in a very concentrated form that will then, in a sense, coerce the deity to give you certain powers. And that's, once you have those powers, you can engage in those activities. So there is a timeline here where you're moving to this period where you have these feats. However, to progress to Buddhahood, you use those practices in prior approximation. That's what gets you to Buddhahood. The feats juice up the process, give you special knowledge, or ability to learn things quickly, uh, allow you to length lengthen your lifespan, um, <laughs> avoiding untimely death, illnesses, you know, at the bottom here, epidemics, who wouldn't want this? Harmful ones, you know, in order to keep practice going and to perhaps help people in an area, increasing your lifespan, your youth, 
your uh, magnificence, power. I met a yogi once. Uh, I was with uh, Herbert Menson uh, doing uh, research in India on yogis. Uh, a monk who late, after he served in the army, he'd come out of Tibet and he'd served in the Indian army. I don't know if he finished his term or left it early, but he then became a monk, but decided this was a crappy way to live and became a monk. And he achieved a lot uh, very quickly. And he knew some technical material that people who had studied for many years didn't know. So I thought, oh, this is you know somebody who's uh, achieved this ability to, he had a particular text that he was working from, but he knew the text extremely well. Um, ferocity, killing, expelling, or confusing harmful beings. You can see how that could be misused. So an important point, you know, with any layout of terminology, there's, I say any, there's help and harm that comes from it. Uh, it tells you one thing and it deceives you about something else. In this case, prior approximation, affecting achievement of feats, and the activities involved in those feats suggests, I mean, it shows you how you get feats, but it suggests that getting those feats are the goal. <coughs> Whereas the feat of Buddhahood is the goal, and it's attained, it can be attained without any of these common feats at all. It's brought about by the practices that are included within prior approximation. Yes. There was one confusing part about fire approximation, and that is the four branches, imagining deity in front, yourself as a deity, and then you talk about the moon disk and the written letters. And I was confused how that is different from when you imagine yourself as a deity. Step number two, you also have the moon disk and letters. Is that two separate? Do you know what I'm saying? Two separate. So you're two separate moons. Two separate moons, so it's yeah. a whole different practice. Yeah. It's a further stage in the practice. That moon that's indicated by moon in the four branches is different from the moon in uh, generating yourself as a deity. Yeah, this is just the kind of thing that, that, that we want to get straight. And like where the words sound, the various usages of sound, get them all straight. And it's, uh, I hope, the virtue of doing this course in this very slow way so we can actually get it straight. Then, for next time, <coughs> Deity Yoga 21 to 35. 139 to 179 and 214 to 227. It might be better in a more digestible bite. Uh, but let's make it um, Um, tantric techniques 65 to 86 that leaves out the concentration without repetition okay and then adjust the other assignments accordingly don't do the unless you want when, it, when it's more digestible you're more out Thank <laughs> you.